Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started and those people trickle in. Um, uh, welcome to another talk in the Macmillan Center's Council on African Studies lecture series. Uh, this week's presenter is Dr. Oluwakemi Balogun, Associate Professor of Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies and Sociology at the University of Oregon and author of Beauty Diplomacy, Embodying an Emerging Nation, the subject of today's talk. Dr. Balligan received a PhD in sociology with a designated emphasis in women, gender, and sexuality from the University of California, Berkeley in 2012, after which she joined the faculty at the University of Oregon in 2013. Examining Nigeria and the Nigerian diaspora, her work intersects issues of race and ethnicity, gender and culture, and nation, globalization, and migration. Uh, previously, her co-edited volume, Africa Every Day, Fun, Leisure, and Expressive Culture on the Continent, won the 2020 African Studies Review Prize for Best Africa-Focused Anthology. And more recently, Beauty Diplomacy, the book we're here to learn about today, was awarded the Adu Snyder Prize from the African Studies Association Women's Caucus. Uh, this book is richly detailed and excessively written, providing a thorough account of the beauty pageant industry in Nigeria and the work of the women whose bodies figure the aspirations and anxieties of a complex emerging nation. We will hold a Q&A after the talk, so please submit your questions using the Q&A feature in Zoom, not the chat. You won't have the ability to raise your hand or uh, speak live. Um, and I will now turn the mic over to Dr. Balligan. Great, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully that is good, you can see it. Okay, so um, as was mentioned, I will be talking today about my book called Beauty Diplomacy, Embodying an, an Emerging Nation. And today I'll spend some time just kind of outlining, outlining the key components um, of the beauty diplomacy narrative, merely from the point of view of beauty contestants. So I'll talk about the ways in which um, beauty contestants interface with this particular narrative, how they mobilize it, and the ways in which they use this beauty diplomacy narrative to promote a particular image of Nigeria as a nation on the rise and as an emerging nation. So before I, I spend some time talking about that and kind of detailing what I mean by beauty diplomacy, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about how I got interested in this project, um, which is often a question I get asked. So I, I became interested in the project because as I was spending more time in Nigeria, I noticed that beauty pageants were increasingly part of the urban landscape of Nigerian uh, society, specifically in terms of major urban cities. I was spending a lot of time in Lagos and I found that beauty con contests were used to promote a range of activities, industries, and ideas. So beauty pageants were both used to promote expected um, elements. So for example, this is an image um, advertising this Delta soap. So they're oftentimes used to promote uh, particular uh, cosmetics or particular um, fashion. So kind of expected areas in which beauty pageants might be connected to. But they were also used to promote particular industries that were in some ways I found to be unexpected. So this is an example from Miss Tourism Nigeria, where this particular PD pageant um, was meant to promote Nigeria's tourism industry. This is an example of Miss Telcom, where uh, this particular pageant is meant to promote the telecommunications industry. And I also became interested in how beauty pageants were used to promote particular ideas about community. Uh, an, an, ide an ideal community. So this is an example of uh, Miss Ecowas peace pageant where the pageant is meant to cement the political community of the uh, economic community of West African states. And I was particularly interested in how pageants were used to promote ideas of the nation. So this is one example of Miss Golden Jubilee where, where this pageant was meant to promote uh, Nigeria's 50 years of independence. So as I mentioned, I just noticed the ways in which beauty pageants were very much embedded in the urban landscape of Nigeria. And I was interested in the ways in which pageants speak to this broader relationship between gender, nation, and embodiment, um, and globalization. In the book, I start off with two key stories, which I will um, trace a little bit today, kind of give you some 
a little bit sketch out those two particular stories. So the first story I talk about in the book is in 2001, Agbani Durego, uh, who represented Nigeria, won the Miss World pageant in 2001. And this was the first time that a Black African had won this particular international competition in the over 50 years that the contest had been, um, been, been staged. And there was a lot of excitement about her winning this pageant. Um, these are some quotes from uh, a range of politicians and state elites who talked about the significance that her win had for Nigeria as a nation. So one politician said, quote, this young and gifted lady symbolizes the new Nigeria and a democratic dividend. Her victory has now opened doors to our youths to compete with the best in the world. Another politician said, quote, that, uh, that Agmani's win signaled a shift from, quote, the dark days of military rule and, the, and Nigeria being seen as, quote, the number one haven for corruption and bad governance to the number one in beauty and intellect. And lastly, another person said, quote, Dorego has become the greatest ambassador of Nigeria and of the continent. Dorego will have access to arenas, areas that even diplomats may not be able to reach. So these particular quotes really highlight um, the ways in which I conceptualized uh, this idea of the beauty diplomacy, um, which is the key kind of argument and, and um, concept and narrative that I developed in the book of just the excitement that was projected onto this single crowning moment of this, um, at the time, 18-year-old woman being given this uh, beauty pageant title on a global stage. And the ways in which her victory was seen as a larger victory for Nigeria as a nation as a whole, as really marking this shift in Nigeria's national trajectory and really symbolizing a much more bright and hopeful future. I think it's important to note that this happened just a couple of years after Nigeria shifted from military rule to being a democratic country. And so again, this was a time where there was a lot of, of hopefulness and uh, excitement about the possibilities that uh, Nigeria has had as a nation. And there was a lot of projection onto how this particular win signaled a broader corrective and shift in Nigeria's national narrative. I juxtapose this optimism uh, around the 2001 Miss World um, win to the following year. So banking on and wanting to further propel the, uh, the excitement and the, um, uh, the excitement of Agbani Durego making this historic win, there was a uh, momentum to want to organize the Miss World pageant, this major international beauty competition in Nigeria itself. So, so to play host to the world in this beauty competition. Um, there was a lot of reasons why they wanted to do this. One was it was a way to uh, promote, again, this, these more positive images of Nigeria in terms of hospitality, in terms of tourism, in terms of the possibility of business investment. And there was a really a lot of excitement about using this, this event as a way of further propelling uh, positive narratives in Nigeria as a nation. So in, on the website that was used to um, advertise the Miss World 2002 being hosted in Nigeria, it said, quote, Miss World would be the most lavish and spectacular production that we've ever undertaken. It's second only to the Olympics for international participation. So again, this idea of promoting Nigeria on the world stage, building off of the momentum of having won the Miss World pageant the year prior. And when I did an interview with one of the people that helped to um, host or, or wanting to host and um, bring Miss World to Nigeria, I asked him, you know, why it was important? And he said, quote, the first reason was to make history in Nigeria and about Nigeria. You remember Agmani was the only Nigerian and Black African to win the Miss World pageant. It is prestigious. Then the idea of why can't Nigeria host it came and the emotions of Agbani's success set in, right? So it was really about building off of this momentum of winning, continuing that success. But ultimately the uh, pageant was moved out of the country for a host of reasons um, because of a set of protests that both happened within the country and outside of the country. I'm happy to talk more about that during q and I have a whole chapter of my book kind of detailing what happened. But because of these series of, of um, protests, the Miss World pageant was canceled and moved to London. Uh, and this is a news article kind of, you know, 
detailing and calibrating who are the winners and the losers of having the Miss World being canceled. But I think ultimately the narrative was around um, that the, the country as a whole lost, right? And that this was a, an opportunity to really promote Nigeria on a global state sca scale because of these protests um, that happened due to a configuration of uh, religious divisions, regional conflicts, um, clashes around class and culture, um, that, that really highlighted, um, again, the ways in which Nigeria was kind of failing to live up to particular promises of Nigeria as a country. So um, in kind of recalling that lost opportunity, uh, one of the people I interviewed said, quote, we lost a great opportunity to showcase Nigeria to the world. It's one that will hurt us for a long time to come. We've got to understand the consequences of what has happened. This will be with us for a long time, right? So thinking again about all of the, the larger stakes that were invested in uh, wanting to host um, the Miss World pageant in 2002. So I use these two stories to open up the book to talk about and juxtapose two larger narratives um, about Nigeria as a nation that these um, stories allow us to, to see and, 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 and unpack. So one is this larger narrative around Africa rising, right? So this is a particular narrative that's broadly tied to the continent, but I'll, I'll talk specifically about how Nigeria in particular is important to that story. But in the African rising narrative, a lot of the elements that are highlighted are around um, Africa having a growing population and that that growing population is not only um, uh, increasingly younger, so kind of talking about youth as being pivotal to shaping new future directions of the country and kind of being um, hopeful in that in that context, but then also pointing to how um, there's an expanding middle class and as such that there is more uh, opportunities for mobility, um, kind of highlighting again these more hopeful narratives of Nigeria as, as a of, of the Africa of Africa uh, at large, but Nigeria in particular as kind of being emblematic of these larger. Um, more hopeful narratives. Um, Nigeria in particular is seen as important to this story because, um, because of its economic and human, um, economic and hu economic um, importance to the continent and also its human, its human uh, capital, right? So it being the largest country in the, uh, in the continent and, and having, at the time when I was started the research, it had the second largest economy in the continent and now has the largest economy in the continent, right? So Nigeria is being, um, pivotal to, uh, and, and it's seen as pivotal to shaping these larger continental narratives and that part of its national, uh, part of the national context in which Nigeria navigates within is, is seeing itself as a leader in these larger, in this larger African rising context. At the same time, uh, and I think that's the second um, element that I highlighted the, of the 2002 This World, where they ultimately weren't able to host the pageant and had to move it out of the country, that particular uh, set of circumstances highlight the larger, another larger um, narrative that um, I think these, these uh, stories allow us to see. And this is around um, this idea of Africa being mired in perennial crisis. So thinking about issues of communal conflict and um, high rates of corruption and the uh, major class cleavages that are um, relevant throughout um, throughout the continent, but specifically in, in Nigeria, um, thinking about how that also is a another kind of set of stories that um, national narratives are, are, are navigating within. And so in positioning the beauty diplomacy narrative as really being an important concept to help us understand Nigeria's national trajectory, part of what I say, what I argue in the book is that this is an important um, concept um, that beauty pageant um, stakeholders um, from the those that are putting together these pageants, the owners of these pageants, to the, 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 um, the contestants, to the fans themselves, um, kind of mobilize different aspects of the beauty diplomacy narrative as a way of kind of working within this larger um, existing framework of saying that uh, we recognize that there are a lot of negative images of Nigeria as a nation. I'm sure many of us here are familiar with those in terms of scams, in terms of high rates of corruption, 
And the beauty pageant industry in particular, which, you know, it trains uh, competitors to be polished, to engage in acts, acts that are seen as hospitable, as warm, um, and to also present uh, beautiful and attractive bodies uh, and also uh, have lively uh, events is seen as a way of course correcting a lot of those, the poor image of Nigeria, of really presenting the more positive angles of Nigeria as a nation. So theoretically, um, part of what the book engages with is looking at the literature on gender and nation. So um, scholars such as Caroline Ferreira, Fer Faria, and Anne McClintock, and um, Jacqueline Mogway, uh, these are scholars that have also talked about the ways in which women and women's bodies, discourses and discussions of women's bodies are important to how nations in particular kind of construct themselves and understand uh, symbolically specific trajectories and um, discourses of a nation. So this is an image that I have up here um, that is a billboard that is kind of, I think, emblematic of this particular gender and nation. Uh, discourse. So this billboard, No Woman, No Nation, um, is meant to signify that, you know, without um, women and the symbolic and political and cultural work that they do, this idea of an, a nation uh, won't continue, right? And so thinking about how that's mobilized through particular discourses of motherhood, uh, particular discourses of sacrifice, of um, also domesticity also becomes a part of that. Uh, particular discourses of morality, uh, of cultural preservation, they're oftentimes mobilized through very gendered discourses of femininity and womanhood. Uh, I will point, point out um, one of the ironies of this particular image, what I think is also tied to, to, to some of the limitations of this, these particular kind of woman as nation discourses, um, is that this was a billboard that was put together by um, one of the one, a politician in Nigeria. So that's the, the man who's um, kind of spotlighted in the front. So thinking about, you know, the ways in which ideas about femininity and womanhood are mobilized through the nation, but what are some of the limitations of that in terms of um, the ways in which men still hold political power and wield political power in the country. So um, I think that, that this, so this image also kind of captures some of that, those contradictions um, that I'm happy to talk more about um, if folks have questions about that. So uh, it, and again, thinking about the work that beauty patents do, part of how I conceptualize it in the book is thinking about them as civic cultural institutions. So um, what I mean by that is that they have particular both political and also symbolic elements. Uh, and so part of how I think about that is thinking about the work that they do both to connect to people from above. So people that are in um, elite positions, particularly politicians, but also celebrities and people that are part of the kind of class and business elite. Uh, and then also uh, how they connect to people from below. So thinking about the work that they also have to do to resonate with Nigerians in terms of everyday Nigerians who can kind of have some, can point to the to the event as having some semblance or connection to um, being representative of the nation um, in some ways. So of course these are very contested and uh, not everyone is on board with viewing beauty pageants as, as doing this kind of particular work, um, but there are ways in which uh, there are specific strategies are involved in terms of how they make, they try to both do this work of connecting to above and connect, connecting below. Uh, I'll share a little bit about how they connect to elites, specifically kind of economic and political elites. So in uh, beauty pageants in Nigeria, it's really common for them to um, put pictures of who, who the government or other leaders, governor or other leaders uh, in whatever state they are hosting the event. So kind of paying homage to governors and other uh, political leaders. This is also an example um, uh, from one of the, the brochures where um, the Delta state governor is promoting Delta like state tourism in the state. So 
politicians also write letters or have advertisements as you know saying this is what our state can offer us this is why you might want to visit us uh, and so these are the ways in which they connect to political elites uh, this is another example of one of the pageant owners meeting with another kind of prominent person in um and where they are hosting the pageant and you know oftentimes the pageants themselves are these not only business vehicles for the owners but also these political vehicles where they're able to gain um, some connection to politicians uh, and this becomes a way for them to solidify those connections uh, pageants are also as i mentioned important to connecting to kind of everyday Nigerians in terms of it being seen as legitimate in some ways. And so part of how they do that is connecting um, what they call a traditional segment. So most pageants in Nigeria will have this traditional segment where um, they have to have, um, you know, attire, um, particular phrasing or knowledge of the states that they represent that's meant to um, signal Nigeria's cultural diversity and it's again a way of having recognizable cultural elements of the nation that's meant to again point to all of the diversity of of Nigeria um, in terms of ethnicity and also being seen as you know these are women through what they're wearing through the not the cultural knowledge that they have that are representing Nigeria in some way um and I can talk more about the nuances of this particular image if folks have questions about it but um these are images from the first two are two of the national pageants that I studied um and then the last one is a um pageant contestant who um, wore this at an international event um, where they have to have a you know a national costume right and so thinking about how are ideas about um, ethnicity like playing out on these local and international stages I have a particular argument about that in the book but um, I will I will save that for if folks are interested in the Q&A so uh, I'll pause and talk a little bit about my methods and again I'm happy to talk more about that um, if folks have questions. So um, the book is based on field work. Uh, the bulk of the field work was done between 2009 and 2010, but I also did follow up um, field work in 2013, 2016, and 2018. I did 65 formal in-depth interviews with a range of stakeholders from contestants to owners to staff to judges. Um, and so kind of getting multiple perspectives of how they viewed the industry. I also did ethnographic observations of two national pageants. Um, and I worked I worked as a chaperone and an unpaid intern for those pageants. So I was able to see kind of behind the scenes how they produce these events. And then I also did a little bit of archival research, newspapers and photographs and documents of the Miss Royal 2002, which I mentioned earlier in the talk. And then another national pageant, the Miss Nigeria pageant, which was the first national pageant um, in Nigeria, which started in 1957. Um, so in those two, the two national pageants that I studied, um, I won't talk too much about them in this talk, but again, I'm happy to answer questions um, because there are ways in which they were distinct. So thinking about how this the beauty diplomacy narrative um, and wanting to promote and project a particular image of Nigeria as positive, as on the rise, as important. Um, this beauty diplomacy narrative kind of relied on different facets of Nigeria. Um, so one was a, um, a cultural facet, um, which I tied to uh, one of the pageants I studied, the Queen Nigeria pageant which is really about centering and focusing on Nigeria's rich cultural heritage and kind of ethnic diversity as the um, key selling point of Nigeria as a nation as being really important to Nigeria, um, being really important to how we understand Nigeria. The other element of this beauty, uh, another strategy of the beauty diplomacy narr narrative was using ideas about cosmopolitanism and promoting Nigeria as a cosmopolitan uh, country, as a country that um, has increasing 
access to wealth that is more um, that's becoming increasingly um, e um, economically mobile as a country that's important to the globe. So kind of seeing, um, I talk about some of the, again, these differences between how is it that, um, what are some strategies that are used to promote this larger beta diplomacy narrative? And I'm happy to talk more about those um, contrasts, comparisons, um, if folks have questions about that. Um, but I'll, I'll talk kind of for the rest of the talk about, um, again, this larger beauty diplomacy narrative and how is it that contestants themselves figure within it? Um, how is it that contestants have to present a particular image of themselves and do specific work um, to be seen as uh, beauty di diplomats and to be taken seriously as the face of doing you know, this symbolic work for the country? So one of the contestants that I interviewed, Penelope, um, when I asked her to talk a little bit about the motivation for participating in con beauty contests and the work that they, that the importance of what um, they did, she told me, quote, number one, we were telling people that here in Africa, women are also given a sense of responsibility and pageantry has been able to say that. There is a whole lot of misconception about women in Africa, in Nigeria, and pageantry has done really well, has been able to not just help Nigeria, but her citizens, right? So thinking about uh, these particular elements of responsibility, about reconfiguring misconceptions about Nigeria, but then also women in, in Nigeria, and thinking about how, um, you know, Penelope, like others, really saw the work that she was doing as being helpful for the country and being helpful for promoting uh, a more positive idea about uh, Nigeria, and really seeing this as a, as a particular civic responsibility, right? Um, the ability to be seen and understood and legitimated as beauty diplomats really hinged on um, cultivating a particular image and cult cultivating particular forms of, of capital, right? And so in the book, I talk about this as an aesthetic capital and thinking about it as a total package. So it's not just about physical beauty, that is an important component of it. So, you know, they are judged in terms of their physical beauty, height, facial features, um, hair, how they carry themselves, etc. But it's also tied to cultivating and communicating a, 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 a particular set of internal dispositions, right? So they have to not only show that they're physically beautiful, but that they are internally beauty, beautiful, right? So in terms of being seen as warm, being seen as connected to uh, people on the ground. So not only being able to go to events that are, you know, hobnobbing with celebrities and um, uh, wealthy people, but also that they can go, you know, on the street and meet people um, from all walks of life and feel comfortable with them, right? So they had to be able to balance that and really show that they had that um, sensibility. So part of the work that beauty contestants did was to promote themselves as um, what I call aesthetic reflexive selves, right? So this was by seeing themselves and promoting themselves as virtuous, as responsible, as forces to be reckoned with, and as women that were upwardly mobile, right? And so there are ways in which they had to do that, communicate that. Uh, and as such, um, that was important to how they were seen as legitimate, as important as people that they, that should be listened to. And, um, and as being kind of this, again, face of this beauty diplomacy narrative. So this aesthetic capital rested on uh, three components, which I'll talk about today. So one is cultural capital, right? So showing that they have particular skills and knowledge set, um, specifically around like speaking well and having a, a certain language ability. Um, they also had to form the right social connections. Um, and so Forming the right social connections was both important in terms of showing that um, they could interact with people from a 
many walks of life, but it was also important to the, their own like personal aspirations, right? So oftentimes they were participating in these pageants as a way of getting important social links um, that they saw as important to their careers and kind of future aspirations. And then also forms of economic mobility, right? So they had to, um, and they were oftentimes very invested in showing that they were um, on the rise economically. And then the pageant in particular was seen as um, responsible for and connected to their economic mobility. Right? So these were all components of how they showed that they were forging um, particular elements of aesthetic capital. So in terms of cultural capital, uh, as I mentioned, one of the key elements of that was being able to speak well. So one of the ways in which they um, talked about and emphasized their ability to speak well, and also just the larger work that they were doing and kind of seeing that larger work as being legitimate and important was to contrast beauty contestants and beauty queens with models. So they would talk about how models, um, they're not really doing important work for the country, whereas beauty queens are doing charity work, we're promoting uh, social causes for the most downtrodden um, elements of Nigerian society, from orphans to um, the, the disabled to the elderly, and we're really having and championing for social causes that will better the country. So Nyeka, one of the beauty contestants shared with me uh, when I asked her how she saw the differences between models and um, beauty queens, uh, she really emphasized the ways in which beauty, beauty queens were doing much more important work and models were, were not in her view. So she said, quote, basically models are just hangers and they walk and they have that blank expression on their face and they're just basically showing the clothes they're not doing anything. They're just walk, come out, walk, come out. That's just what they do. But for pageantry, pageantry is you, your beauty, intelligence, creativity, boldness, communication. It's basically you showcasing you and what you've got. So again, um, it was a way of sh th this particular quote and many others that felt similarly wanted to show that they were doing work that they saw as much more important. And um, one of the ways in which they did that was, again, again making these contrasts with models. Uh, a similar quote, Ogechi says, quote, they're not talking about Nigeria when they interview some models. The models can't even speak good English. In modeling, you don't have to talk, but in pageantry, you can't escape that. You have to talk. The camera will always get you. Okay, so these, there were these expectations around um, having to talk in interview segments during the pageant themselves. They're, they're often asked questions about, you know, what are some elements of Nigeria that are important to promote? What are key current events in Nigeria that you might want to be, speak to? So they're expected to be able to, to, to be aware of larger cultural events and um, current events. Um, and this element of speaking well um, was also tied to larger ideas about class. So around accent, um, your ability to speak English well. And so there were also these class dimensions around the, these particular forms of, of cultural capital. And again, I think this, this, this quote also illustrates how uh, in speaking, they will also be, be expected to speak about Niger as a nation, right? And so thinking about that as important work that they saw themselves doing. Another um, element of the aesthetic capital, uh, which is key to uh, the beauty contestants, is how it was important for how they, um, how social capital was important to how they um, saw the work that they were doing. And, and also the, the bang that they would get um, for participating in, in this work. So oftentimes the motivation for participating in the pageants were in part to get um, access, access to echelons of Nigerian society that they otherwise wouldn't have as easy access to. Uh, and so uh, some of the quotes that illustrate that um, from the beauty contestants, one said, quote, it makes you a better person. You have an opportunity to have the best and also improve. You meet a lot of better people. 
you have an opportunity to achieve something, if there is anything that you want to do, but you don't have an opportunity, it's going to pave a way for you to do anything that you want to do. Right. So again, this idea of pageants being a, um, some kind of pathway to success. And, you know, that was ways of them also wanting to gain um, success for themselves. But it was oftentimes often framed as um, this would be also a positive boon for the country, right? So if, if I'm doing well, if I'm a, a role model for others, if people put me on this platform where I'm, you know, in, um, in public events, um, spotlighted in the newspaper, you know, as a beauty queen, it's also positively reflective of the country. Uh, another contestant said, quote, I made fantastic contacts. That was one major thing. People I don't know before, the movers and the shakers who can help you in life. I met them and they were like, oh, you are the new girl. Right. So this idea of making contacts, um, having social access and cultivating and developing and growing forms of social capital were important um, for contestants and important for how they were seen as, as beauty diplomats. Another angle of social capital was um, marrying well, right? And so um, probably one of the most uh, poignant uh, observations I had was um, when we I was observing the contestants rehearsing for the show and, um, you know, they were running through rehearsals on stage and I was uh, kind of in the corner and one of the staff members, um, who was an older man um, in his 40s, um, so a, a good two decades older than the contestants, you know, he had shared with me that he, he was scared of them. And I was surprised and asked him why. Um, and he shared with me that, you know, you'd be surprised. One of them might be the future wife to a minister, so a major politician and head of the national ministry. And they might be the one to make that phone call to make or break your deal, um, make or destroy a deal. So thinking about how um, contestants in getting access to particular social circles are also, also assumed to, and oftentimes do, marry um, Nigerian elites, politicians, business um, people. And um, that being another way of you know, cementing and solidifying elite status which again is seen as reflecting positively on the country. So alongside um, social capital, another element that they had to cultivate um, and portray was ideas about economic capital. This is most um, prominent through the emphasis on cars. So, as part of the pageant, um, beauty queens will oftentimes be gifted a car as one of the, the prizes for winning the pageant. And um, oftentimes, you know, these are young women, so they're in their late teens, early 20s. Um, this is oftentimes their very first car, right? And so this car symbolized not only kind of economic capital because it kind of symbolized you know I am moving up in the world I have access to a car um, and it, but I also found out that it signaled a lot of ideas about just um, logistical mobility so like being able to move around um, Lagos in particular um, using a car was seen as important to cultivating the status of, of being a beauty queen and being an important figure in the country because they would say you know, because of my status, because of the recognition I have in the country, I can't be seen like in a taxi. I can't be seen like worse in a bus um, because it wouldn't be reflective of the status that I have. Right, so thinking about how there are particular ideas and ideals about class mobility and economic mobility that are also embedded um, within the work that they see themselves doing. Okay. So I think that the, the, the kind of cultural capital and the social capital and the economic capital that I've outlined um, kind of paints this particular kind of more rosy picture of um, the work that beauty queens are doing and kind of how they see beauty pageants in terms of presenting particular opportunities that they are able to leverage 
that they see as not only important for their own personal lives and their own personal aspirations, but also as, as important to the national aspirations of Nigeria. Right, so there's a particular kind of very optimistic rosy story. But um, part of the argument that I make in the book and that the contestants shared with me is that this, um, these narratives are constrained, right? So the uh, ways in which they are able to um, gain economic, the, the degree to which they are able to gain economic mobility is oftentimes not as stratospheric as the public expects, right? And so some of the ways in which that was communicated to me is that um, contestants would tell me that they had uh, a lot of economic expectations that were projected onto them, right? So things like getting um, and having to field phone calls from relatives um, and friends saying, you know, I saw you on TV, I saw you that you won, um, that means you have access to all of this money. Um, I, I heard that you bought a house in um, Victoria Island, which is like one of the most um, kind of ritzy uh, parts of Laos. Um, I heard that you have X, Y, and Z, right? And so um, the expectation was that they had access to this kind of enormous wealth. Um, and it just wasn't as... Um, it didn't reflect the reality. So for example, even the person that wins the pageant, um, they're put on salary. So they don't get all of the money all at once. It's, you know, given out uh, incrementally. And so they would talk about a lot of the um, anxiety um, of, of people expecting that they would then be able to help them out, that they would have access to all of this money. And they just, um, it just didn't have, it didn't reflect the reality. Um, another, angle is that um, they would talk about how um, the pageants, you know, because they were kind of key, became keenly aware of how the pageants um, themselves, uh, in terms of the owners, in terms of how they were um, organized, that they were also um, not always invested in having the um, beauty queens like reach all of their, um, to kind of be able to mobilize and leverage and capitalize on all of the opportunities they wanted to. So they had to sign particular contracts. Uh, that meant that all of the opportunities that they were presented with or could um, go for had to go through, you know, the organization, which, you know, they're looking for the best interest of the, the passion itself, not necessarily for the best, best interest for the contestants. So they would talk about how um, they felt in some ways kind of truncated uh, in terms of how, um, to what extent they could really um, be in full control of their careers, uh, especially during their, their time of the period of rain, right? Uh, and then another constraint was just dealing with public scrutiny, right? So um, they had to kind of toe the line and navigate this really um, careful image of themselves. So on the one hand, they had to project an image of themselves as upwardly mobile, as having some access to money, as being comfortable in these elite spaces. They couldn't be seen as too elitist or too classist because um, they would just then be seen as out of touch. Um, they had to project an image of themselves as attractive, but not too sexy, uh, because if they were seen as too sexy, they were seen as um, somehow scandalous, right? So there were all of these kind of particular um, ideas and ideals about class and gender and sexuality that they had to navigate in the public eye, right? So the, they're oftentimes, you know, featured on TV, featured in media, uh, and this particular public scrutiny was another set of constraints that they had to navigate and be attuned to. Um, I think the, the I'll kind of end on, um, to kind of wrap it up and think about uh, the ways in which um, beauty diplomats kind of saw their work, right? So on the one hand, they realize that there are these constraints. There are there are ways in which they, um, especially when I did follow up interviews with folks um, who had um, kind of reflected more on their on their experiences and kind of telling me about, you know, some of the less glossy um, angles of, of the beauty pageant industry. Um, 
one contestant in particular, um, kind of again was telling me about you know a lot of the um, pitfalls that she had to navigate, broken promises, etc. Um, but she still ended on kind of this note of thinking about empowerment, right? So thinking about empowerment through this very gendered understanding of um, the importance that beauty patents were, the important work that beauty patents were doing for um, women in Nigeria in particular, right? And so this is a very kind of neoliberal way of thinking about power in very, in, in many respects, right? So it's, it's very much focused on power at the individual level, like me as an individual, that the contestants, as, the contestant as an individual woman has access to power, which I don't think necessarily um, troubles power structures in like more power structures more broadly, but it was a way of them talking about the significance of the work that they were doing, right? So Kamdi kind of illustrates this in this quote, which I'll end on, um, where she talks about, you know, after kind of narrating again all of these pitfalls and disappointments that she had um, weathered, she talked ultimately as this being important for her, right? So she said, first of all, it was a competition with probably thousands of girls across the nation. You feel, wow, this is another massive step. It puts in your mind, like, I can do this. In the course of it, you get a lot of girls telling you how much they want to be like you, how much you inspire them. You can actually have a voice. So it's empowering as a woman in Nigeria, right? And so thinking about the broader context of feeling that women as a whole, especially being a young woman, being kind of marginalized in terms of uh, Nigerian society, I'm feeling that, you know, being legitimated as beauty diplomats, as being um, women that should be paid attention to, uh, was seen as, again, a way of securing empowerment, right? And as Kamdi illustrates, uh, it's a way that they, they it was, it had um, personal importance to them, right? And, and thinking about this as a way of um, promoting more positive elements, right? Um, not only for themselves, but also for um, being role models for, other, for others in the country. Okay, so I will end there. I'm happy to field any questions. Um, thank you. Okay, that was a that was a great talk. That was really interesting. Um, thank you for for that. Um, I want to remind everybody to put your questions in the Q&A function on the bottom and we'll get to them as we go. Um, but I have the moderator privilege of getting to ask the first question. Um, when I was reading the book, I thought about um, uh, like from media studies, star studies, and this idea that the star is uh, sort of a collective endeavor that's produced by uh, you know, screenwriters and is produced by the actor themselves, as well as, you know, um, number of, uh, technicians. Um, and I wonder if you could um, address some of like the, the collective production of uh, pageant contestants and how these sort of normative um, uh, understandings of, of the body and, and of identity are created in that collective. Um, and specifically, I'd be interested in the fan culture and like how fans um, help produce, um, you know, the, the the star or the the queen as like a as a as a as a character. You know. Yeah, that's like a really interesting question. Um, so I think I think that your um, your framing is really spot on in terms of saying that um, there are many ways in which beauty queens are produced. Um, in terms of them having to navigate specific set of expectations, right? And I remember one contestant telling me, like, oh, it's almost like I have a double face of, like, I'm wearing a mask in some cases because I know that when I'm in a public spotlight, um, I need to maneuver a certain way um, because people will be watching what I wear, how I talk, how I interact with people. And so there is this kind of awareness of that. And I think the public is um, one way in which you see that kind of fan element playing out. Um, so the public in general 
is not assumed to be wholly entirely like it's not necessarily just made up of fans right so they're fans and also critics right and that's kind of the larger pub like the larger ways in which the public gets, gets construed right that these are either people that are following us and think that we're doing important work um and there are fans out in terms of like always staying on top of like who's the latest beauty queen and um thinking about that um so i think the fan element is interesting in the sense that these are people that fans are on the whole supportive of the industry and sort of saying like oh this is either entertaining work or this is important work um but they're also fanning the public attention in some ways like they're also like um because they're fans and they're paying attention they also have their hand on the pulse of like what are the scandals that are going on in the industry like what are you know what are the ways in which people are um mis making mistakes or um might be sullying a particular reputation so uh i think then kind of fan culture both is a way of um fueling the industry in terms of like saying you know these are the people that are in some ways are paying attention to us um but and it's also a way of um that kind of check of like saying okay don't don't go um don't go too far because if you go too far if you do something that people perceive as a scandal then this is how it's going to get spun um but i would say the most the like the strongest um element of who i saw like producing pageant queens were the the owners like the owners and the staff they had i mean and it was it's largely if like a function of how i was like my own positionality in the research as well right so you know i saw more of like that behind the scenes work of like okay this is what you shouldn't do this is what you should do um yeah Okay, um, I can throw another question while I think people are gathering their thoughts. Um, I wanted to circle back to this question of authenticity and uh, how um, contestants make claims to authentic Nigerian identity and how they present that in uh, different contexts. So, you know, whether they're pitching to a uh, international audience or a national audience or a regional audience, how uh, how that's sort of differentiated and how they, they negotiate those claims to authenticity or make those claims to authenticity? Yeah, so um, I don't know. So one of the, I'm, I'm going back to one of the slides I had. Um, I don't know if you remember the three different um, cultural um, outfits um because i think that kind of um the reason why so i have those images in the book and the reason why i chose them specifically was that um as you can see that they were they were very similar especially the first two um and and they they are representative representative of a particular kind of ethnic group from a state right and so those you know, beading, um, those clothes, the, the clothing and accessories, there's a particular kind of language um, and recognizable elements that people see as, oh, this is culturally and ethnically and ethnically authentic, right? And I think that could also be contested because it's not like as if these are not changing cultural elements, right? And so we can question and um, interrogate this idea of authenticity. But um, the ways in which they were projected in the two national pageants that I studied. So I'll talk about it kind of at the um, local, state, national context, uh, and then at the international context. So the two national pageants that I studied, they both had um, this traditional segment, which was one of the most prominent ways in which they were able to lay claim to authenticity. Because again, these are recognizable elements of Nigerian culture that even outside of the pageant world are seen as, oh, this is authentically Nigerian. Um, and in those two photos, if you remember, um, they're pretty similar, like in terms of how they look, because again, these are like the, the larger symbols that people rely on to represent 
particular ethnic groups, et cetera. But the claims to authenticity in the two different groups differed um, in part in terms of how they were structured. So one of the national pageants uh, was organized around um, like a state competition system and then whoever won the state competition then went on to the national pageant. And um, that th this is the Queen Nigeria pageant that I that I studied um, and talk about in the book. And in that pageant, um, contestants had to lay some to have some kind of claim to the state that they represented. So either they lived there, or they had studied there, or they were born there, or they had some kind of cultural heritage there. Um, and oftentimes, that pageant then would frame their contestants as being as being much more authentic, right? That these are authentically people, women from these states that then have some connection to the communities in these states, right? And that, that's a way of solidifying authenticity. The other pageant uh, was not organized the same way. So they did not have a state competition that then laid up to a national competition. Instead, they had um, auditions in various cities in Nigeria, and then they selected finalists and then randomly assigned those finalists to different states in the country. So in terms of how that pageant, which is the most beautiful girl in Nigeria, how that pageant is framed nationally is that it's seen as inauthentic because it's seen as, oh, these are not, because the contestants will oftentimes represent a, a state that they don't have a, like don't necessarily have a connection to. Um, but again, they, they have this traditional segment where all of the states will have this, this you know, garb, the, tra the traditional outfits. Um, but the ways that that pageant would frame authenticity would be to say like, well, even though um, these contestants are not necessarily from these states, because Nigeria is a diverse country, uh, we need to be able to learn about other ethnic groups that are not our own. So this is actually a way of strengthening our diversity because these contestants are, are learning about a variety of ethnic communities and ethnic cultures, which in some ways is a way of kind of reconfiguring the benchmarks of authenticity, right? You can talk about how, well, yes, Nigeria is culturally diverse. Can we really talk about ourselves as authentically diverse if you don't know anything beyond your ethnic group and where you grew up and et cetera, right? So it's another, it was another way of laying claim to idea, the idea of Nigeria as cosmopolitan, not just uh, globally, but domestically. Uh, and then lastly, on the international level, um, so internationally, the idea of like authenticity um, only resonated in the sense of what are elements of culture usually represented through like clothing and accessories that would be seen as authentically Nigerian. And the focus on specific ethnic groups was less um, prominent because the assumption is that, oh, people don't know about ethnic groups outside of the country. Like they don't know any of the distinctions. They don't know any of the nuance. So we just need to have an outfit that's both like eye-catching and seen as interesting. And that people will say, oh, that fits in. Like it fits in, but it doesn't fit out. It's not so outlandish. Um, but that people recognize like, oh, this is Nigerian. Like, it just makes sense. So again, those are some of the weight, the different dimensions um, that I can speak to. Thank you. We, we have a question from uh, the audience. Um, thanks for the talk, Emmy. I was wondering if issues of objectification and harassment came up in your conversations with contestants. Yeah, yeah, that was that was one um, element of kind of the constraints that they had to navigate. Um, in terms of, you know, being, having to, yeah, deal with situations that they just oftentimes weren't prepared for. Um, and again, being part of social circles that they were newly navigating and they were, you know, these are young women. Uh, yeah, so that was definitely... Um, something that came up. And I think there were there were, people kind of navigated that and dealt with that um, in different ways. So for some people, if they did face like overt um, harassment, um, 
they would kind of remove themselves from those social circles. Uh, and then for others, um, they just kind of had to learn who were people that they should and should not interact with. Um, and so that became another um, kind of part of learning the ropes of, again, these social circles that they were thrust into. Um, in terms of like just broadly objectification, um, I think there were ways in which they were keenly aware that their like the the work that they were doing and like the the work that their bodies represented had value that weren't that wasn't just accruing to them. So they were aware that oh, there are people making money off of our face and likeness, um, and we're not seeing the full benefits of this as individuals, right? And so there were I was surprised how aware they were of that um, and in some cases very upset about that and then in other cases it was just like okay I'm going to navigate within I know there are these sets of constraints I'm going to navigate within this to get what I need um, out of this process out of the system and then um, kind of act accordingly. All right um, if there aren't any more questions from, aha, uh -huh, there is another at the, at the last second. Um, this talk is really lovely. I am thinking on um, how does this play uh, with the international competitions, especially when there aren't many African contestants? Um, I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think on the whole kind of on the international level, um, in terms of Nigeria in the African context, it's seen, or at least from the vantage point of the um, the promoters and the owners uh, in Nigeria, they see the, the beauty competition as being important to the continent, um, especially, I mean, they still bank on having won uh, Miss World over 20 years ago, right? So saying, you know, we were the first to do this, we are trailblazers, um, and that on the continent, we have one of the like longest running um, competitions. So seeing themselves as a leader on the continent, um, but more it, like more broadly globally, um, Nigeria is not like as competitive as other countries. So thinking about how um, a lot of Latin American countries and increasingly countries in Asia, the Philippines, um, also India has had a winning streak in the nineties. So thinking about how um, internationally, um, some of the con contestants would tell me that they felt at a disadvantage and some of the ways in which, and I think I allude to this a little bit in the book, but some of how I see this shifting was around conversations about plastic surgery. So they would talk, there's some countries where if you win your, your national competition, you're gonna be gifted with plastic surgery um, before you go to international competitions. That's not the case in Nigeria. Like they don't give you like this package. Um, but when I was doing the research, plastic surgery was not as common in Nigeria. Um, if folks wanted plastic surgery, they had to go outside of the country most of the time. Or um, I think when I when I was doing the bulk of the research um, in 2010, there was someone who had like a consultancy who would bring in a um, surgeon from abroad occasionally to do, to do um, surgeries. Um, but now plaque surgery in Nigeria is becoming as like this boon in the last few years. So I don't know to what extent that has changed and shifted. Um, what, to what extent um, PD contestants are doing plastic surgery. They were not doing it when I started this research a decade ago. Maybe they are now. And that is one way in which they see themselves as, as possibly being more competitive. But on the larger global scene, Nigeria is seen as important in the continent, but not as globally competitive as other countries. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, I think it's super interesting to think about the sort of different tiers of pageant circuits that they, I mean, they mm -hmm. have so many different, um, you know, geographical regions and scope uh, as a global phenomenon. Um, if, uh, if there are more questions, this would be the time to, to pass them on.
Otherwise, I can ask one last question. Um, sure. I'd love it if you could talk a little bit about um, uh, religion and like the way that religion informs uh, people's participation in pageants and, and how, sort of how they're received. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, there's a lot of different layers to that. So um, I'll say that in pageants, the assumption is that all of the contestants are Christian. Um, and that's not entirely the case. Um, it's mostly, mostly they are Christian, but not entirely. So um, that assumption kind of plays out in various ways. So um, I'll say that, so from one of the pageants I studied, one of the contestants that won actually was Muslim. And that was shocking to people, just like, oh, wow, like, Muslims, I'm surprised that someone that's Muslim would participate, uh, just because there are certain assumptions about kind of Muslim women and bodily display and not wanting to display your body, etc. And kind of assuming that there's a uniform um, ideology around religion. Um, on the whole, Nigeria is a very religious and religiously conservative country. Um, so even for those that, even though the presumption is that those that are against pageants are mostly Muslim, there's also a narrative in the country about how Christians who are culturally conservative um, and who are conservative um, wouldn't also want to participate in pageants because they're, they're very religious. Um, there was some pushback that I got from that. Um, so some would tell me the story of, um, oh, Esther, Queen Esther which is like a biblical story um, about a woman who ended up competing in a pageant um, because of the, I forgot the exact elements of the story, but it's like a, um, she even competed in a pageant to like secure um, the fate of her community uh, of her king, right? And so there's this biblical story about a woman participating in a pageant in the Bible. So people would point to that as like scripture of saying, oh, well, even though people think that Christians shouldn't participate in this because it's seen as we're wearing clothing that's too revealing, that it's it's too, um, uh, it's not conservative enough, that actually we have biblical evidence for how pageants are Christian and helpful, etc. cetera. Um, so that's one way in which it played out, particular understandings of kind of Christianity and Islam. Um, Trying to think of another angle. I know very recently, um, uh, it might have been last year or the year before, uh, a Muslim woman won this Nigeria, um, and she was also a hijabi. Um, and so that was considered like, wow, this is like history making. Um, so again, the assumption is that Muslims don't participate. What does it mean for a Muslim woman to win? Not only is she Muslim, but she covers. So there are particular understandings of kind of religion that I think are being troubled um, through pageants, but then also cemented in particular ways, right? And so part of um, why the pageant got moved out of Nigeria in 2002 is because of religious ideas, like religion um, played a role. And it, it's just so complex. I don't want to spend too much into it. But um, the, part of the reasons why they didn't want to host a pageant is that, you know, some people were saying that, you um, you know, it's against um, our kind of cultural and religious viewpoints. Uh, and then part of what ultimately made, um, had it such that they had to relocate the pageant is because someone had published a news article that, you know, I don't know why people are so upset about hosting the pageant here. If Prophet Muhammad was alive today, he would have selected one of the um, B contestants as his wife. And that kind of sparked a whole set of protests and riots um, because of religion, right? So again, thinking about how religion becomes this, um, um, fuels this particular um, set of conflicts. Um, yeah, so I think that's those are all the layers, I think, around religion. Um, oh, just one more last quick thing. So another way in which it played out was around bikinis. So having a swimsuit segment or not was oftentimes um, framed in terms of religion. Um, one of the frames was around religion. So saying one of the, the one of the competitions I studied did not have a pageant, did not have a bikini segment. The other one did. And part of the reasoning for not having um, swimsuit sec section in one of the pageants 
was like saying this is a way of being religiously sensitive because it's it's a there's a presumption that if you're religious whether christian or muslim you don't want to um have um you don't want to wear a bikini on stage right and so there's just some of the ways in which religion played out thank you that was uh that's a good good answer a lot to think about and chew on yeah um I want to thank you so much for this talk today. This was really interesting, really engaging. I really enjoyed the book. Um, and um, if there's no more questions, I think we can we can call it a day. Great. Yeah, I'm happy if folks have any follow-up things. I'm happy to correspond over email. So thank you. <laughs>